This is my folding recumbent e-bike. It's an HP Velotechnique Grasshopper FX that I spent about a month converting to electric. I want to talk about what goes into converting a bike to electric, how I did this, and how it turned out. This bike was already super fun to ride. Seriously, if you've never ridden a recumbent, they are incredibly comfortable to ride. But I wanted to make hills easier, reduce wear and tear on the brakes, and overall make it even more fun to ride. So, electric. Unlike upright bikes, recumbents, especially two-wheel recumbents, are rare enough that there's not really any standard wisdom for electrifying. With underseat steering, where should I mount the display? Where's the best place to mount the battery? How do I mount the throttle and other controls? This project was great because I got to address all these unknowns in my own way. Let's start with the motor. I'm using an all axle hub motor from Gren Technologies. I went with this motor for two reasons. First, it's one of the lightest direct drive motors on the market at just over four kilograms. Second, being a direct drive motor, it's capable of regenerative braking with a low cogging drag. Regenerative braking is the killer feature of EVs. It's naturally anti-locking, it doesn't use any additional wear components, it's nearly silent, and it extends your range. Wow, it's rare that a feature offers this many positives. The only downside is the cogging drag, which is the drag induced on the motor by the magnetic field, and it's only an issue in coasting. Thankfully, the cogging drag on this particular motor is not zero, but basically zero. I don't have dynamo numbers to actually compare, but I don't notice any extra drag on the system when it's unpowered. Now, some people argue that regenerative braking doesn't really do much for e-bikes, which is only really true if you're going to be like touring on long, flat roads without much brakes. Riding around town on flat ground, I get around 5% energy recovery. In a hillier place like Seattle, I've heard of people able to recover some 60% of the energy used. What's more, e-bikes, being hybrid human electric vehicles, allow you to very easily, mechanically speaking, not effort speaking, convert human energy to electrical energy. Meaning you can do things like power lights, a phone, whatever, using just your legs. But also, this discussion about energy recovery is missing the other benefits of regenerative braking. Namely, again, the actual braking parts. It's all weather, silent, and most importantly, you get to massively extend the life of your mechanical brake system, saving you time and money. For e-bikes, where the cost of electricity to run them over their lifetime is significantly less than the cost to replace any component whatsoever, reducing the wear on your braking system is just pure benefit. I also went with the front hub variant of this motor, and I'm using a front hub for four reasons. First, maintenance. Front hubs are significantly easier to install and remove. Ever tried dealing with a flat tire on a rear hub motor? To say it's a pain is an understatement. You'd think that dealing with a derailleur and chain isn't that difficult, but when you add the weight of a motor to that, it becomes an exercise in frustration. Second, I have an internally geared hub on the rear wheel already, and I really like having that. Yes, there's a real derailleur and an internally geared hub. It's really no different than having a front derailleur conceptually. Having more gears is essential on recumbents, where you don't have the option to stand up for more power. A rear hub motor would require me to give up two thirds of my gear range. Third, balance. Given where I ended up mounting the battery, having the motor up front keeps the center of gravity close to where it was before adding the electrics. Lastly, I like the idea of having all wheel propulsion. Human power in the rear, electric in the front. The downsides of having the motor up front are that I have slightly less traction there, meaning there's a higher chance of spinning out if I'm riding on, say, loose gravel. And there's also a higher chance of falling during regenerative braking, similar to how grabbing the front brake can lead you to lose traction and fall. I ride almost exclusively on pavement, so I'm not worried about spinning out, but I have heard of people losing traction while regenerative braking on wet and oily roads. After taking all that into consideration, I think that the risks of losing traction are low enough and the mitigation easy enough, use the rear brake more when braking under those low traction conditions, that it's worth taking. Besides, it's a recumbent. Being lower to the ground means that it won't harm me as much if I fall. Now that we're done with why I chose this motor, let's move on to actually installing the thing. I removed the front wheel and transferred the tire and inner tube to the motor, which was already pre-laced into a wheel. Then I slid the motor on and installed the torque arm, a very important piece to keep the motor in place while in use. Even on moderately powered motors, they can output enough torque to rotate in the dropouts. This motor is attached using quick-release skewers. The torque arm is basically the only thing keeping the motor from rotating in place. Then I had to fix the brakes. The brake rotor Grin included with the motor was slightly out of true, meaning that it wobbled a bit while it spun. No worries, I just had to true it myself, which I put off because I thought it would be like truing a wheel, something I find rather daunting. Instead, it's just using an adjustable wrench to bend it until it's true enough that it no longer rubs on the brake caliber. So simple. Next up is the pedal assist system, or PAS. 
In e-bikes, there are typically two types of paths you can choose from, cadence-based or torque-based. Cadence-based paths measures how fast you're pedaling and applies motor power based off that. Typically, this works by giving you more assist when you pedal faster. I'm not a fan of cadence-based systems. They work, but it feels much more like pedal as cruise control, and not like my pedaling is actually doing anything. It's just not a good feel to me. The other type of paths measures torque, which combined with rotation also gives you power. This allows the system to apply motor power in proportion to how much power or torque you're putting in. Struggling up a steep hill at a low RPM but high torque, the motor will sense that and still apply appropriate power. Cadence-based systems would have just scaled back the power, basically requiring you to either downshift or use a throttle to push more power through the motor. Having tried both systems, I vastly prefer torque-based paths because it feels like I'm actually contributing to the ride. The torque sensor I'm using replaces the bottom bracket, with the sensor cable coming out of the left side. With the right tools, doing this isn't that difficult. Use a crank puller to remove the cranks, then a bottom bracket bridge to unscrew the two halves of the bottom bracket shell, pull it out, and there you go. Much more involved than truing a brake disc, yet also much less daunting. Anyway, installing the torque sensor is essentially the reverse of that. Apply grease to the threads and insert each half of the shell. Then use a bottom bracket wrench to screw it together. Off camera, I installed the chain ring, guards, and bolts onto the torque sensor spider. Then I bolted that assembly on. I put the chain on, then I installed the crank arms, and finally the pedals. I'm going with these half flat, half clipless pedals out of aspiration. I'm told that clipless pedals are especially useful on recumbents, where they provide comfort by doing the work of keeping your feet on the pedals, which can be a bit uncomfortable when you don't have gravity helping out, but these also acknowledge that most of the time I'll be using my normal shoes. At least I'm being honest with myself. Let's move on and talk about the display. I'm using one of Grin's Cycle Analysts, which, yeah, uses a two-line character display that wouldn't look out of place on a bike from the 90s, but there's nothing else on the market with better software. Usually the display is mounted on the handlebars, though with the underseat steering I have on this bike, there's not an obvious location for where to mount the display. Instead, I mounted the display further away, up front on the boom. This idea is an original, and I'd like to thank Mark Havron of At Solar eBike for providing inspiration. This is a 3D printed part with a cycle analyst facing me and the front light bolted to the other end. It took me two rough prototypes in PLA with large layer heights before I committed to spending a couple days printing a final part in PETG, which was definitely worth the wait. This mount is a two-piece part with a shaft and the giant housing itself. The shaft mounts on this tube on the boom and is bolted in place using one of the existing embosses. Ascending from that shelf is a GoPro style mount, which allows me to mount the display housing and adjust the angle of the housing however I want. This is then secured using an M10 bolt. The housing is mostly hollow. There's a column in the center for bolting the cycle analyst in place. All this extra space makes for a great place to hide the rat's nest of cables and connectors. On the bottom is an access panel, which itself has a small ellipse for cables to pass through. As I sit in the bike, the cycle analyst is directly in my field of view meaning I don't have to look away from the road to see the dashboard. In fact, let's talk about what's on the dashboard. This is more or less the default setup for the current Cycle Analyst 3.2 software. This first screen is a basic dash, a battery level indicator on the top left, next to battery voltage. On the top right, I have it alternating between trip distance and motor temperature in Celsius. On the bottom left, there's a throttle indicator, which will change when I pull the brake to indicate the brake sensor is tripped. Next to it is an indication of human power and then current power pulled from the battery in watts, as measured by the motor controller, which is the only thing directly plugged into the battery. On the bottom right is the current speed, which I have set to miles per hour because I'm in America and all our signage and laws are in miles per hour. There are 11 more screens, which I can easily cycle through. I'm only going to cover the ones I actually use, which are the human power dash, the energy stats, the human power stats, and the regenerative braking stats. The human power dash shows me power pulled from the battery, speed, human power, torque, and cadence. It's fun because then it tells you exactly how much power you're putting in at that moment. These next few are more for reviewing your rides after the fact, starting with energy usage, which shows for the current trip the total electrical energy used in watt hours and your energy efficiency. Mine's showing an incredibly low 3.1 watt hours per mile, which looks amazing, but that mostly tells you I don't really use the motor system. Next up is human stats, which shows the amount of watt hours I put in, as well as average human power and average cadence. One thing I wish the cycle analyst would show is human efficiency and total efficiency. Right now I have to manually do the math to figure out that I'm operating at a combined efficiency of 12 watt hours per mile, which is impressive and around one and a half times more efficient than my cargo bike at the same speeds. I'd love to compare it to a road bike, but I don't have numbers for one. 
The last screen I want to talk about is the regenerative braking stats. This shows the percentage of energy recaptured by regenerative braking during the trip on the left, and the right side alternates between total amount of amp hours pulled from the battery, called the forward amp hours, and the amount of amp hours recaptured by regenerative braking, called regen amp hours. The percentage figure is calculated by dividing the regen amp hours by the forward amp hours. This provides some interesting insight, and is helpful for providing data to support that, oh yeah, regen actually can recapture a fairly significant amount of energy. It's also fun to artificially manipulate this number, which you can do by turning on a constant region and pedaling through it. It's kind of fun to see like 900% region because you've put in significantly more power than has been used. Though there are also other reasons to artificially increase your region. Most obviously is just wanting to increase your range at a time when maybe it's easier to do, like pedaling during a descent. Now let's move over to the other side of the display housing and overall talk about the lighting system, starting with the front light. This is a Sate Light SPL01. It's powered from the bike's battery, which means I don't have to worry about charging a separate battery for the light. This thing is capable of up to 1800 lumens, which corresponds to about 30 watts. There's also low beam mode, which is lower power and adds a cutoff to the beam, and even daytime running lights. Generally, I keep it on daytime running lights and low beams at night. I also have a rear light mounted on the other end of the bike. This one is powered by the e-bike battery, and it's always on when the e-bike is powered on. Now, with these lights being powered directly off the battery, that does mean that if the e-bike's battery ever dies on me mid-ride, I will lose my lights, which is obviously a dangerous thing to happen, especially during night. The way I'm mitigating this risk is I configure the psychoanalyst to cut power to the motor before the battery's low voltage cutoff point. This gives me a buffer where I won't have any motor power, but I'll certainly be able to see. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, I can use the motor as a dynamo hub just by engaging a constant region. Both of these mean that, in practice, I don't expect to ever lose these lights. Just aft of and below the display is the motor controller. This is the second most important piece of the build, just after the motor itself. Motor controllers take the power from the battery, the throttle, or pass signal, feedback from the motor itself, and generate the AC waves necessary to drive the motor. The particular motor controller I'm using is Grin's Phase Runner. This is mounted directly on the boom, which keeps the motor cable nice and short. Of course, I had to route the cable to the psycholanus in a weird way because there's so much extra cable, but that's fine, I'd rather not have to extend the motor cable. Next up, let's talk about the controls. On the right is the throttle and brake sensor, while on the left is the psychoanalyst multifunction switch. Let's start with the left handlebar, which only has the multifunction switch, but that control has a lot going on. This allows me to easily turn the bike on and off using this power switch on the side. I can also quickly cycle through every screen on the cycle analyst using this M button, and I can change the pedal assist and even enable a constant region. Currently, I have that set to pedal assist in increments of 0.5 motor watts to human watts, up to a ratio of 2 to 1. So 0 or no pedal assist, 0.5 motor watts to human watts, 1, 1 1.5, and 2. If I'm going faster than 5 miles an hour, then I can also enable a constant region. This is set in percentage of total region, which starts at 0, and as I hit the down button, it'll go up in increments of 20%, 0, 19, 39, up to 100% of total region signal. I never go higher than 39% in practice. I found that to be pretty strong anyway. This constant region is great when going down a slope. I can leisurely descend, enjoy the ride, and charge up my battery. Installing this took some custom parts. I shifted the grit sleeve down a little and clamped it there. The little clamp wouldn't fit under the shifter cable, so I designed and printed a custom clamp piece with affordance for the shifter cable. It works great. The piece is oriented with the power button facing inward. This is so I don't accidentally power off the bike if it brushes against something while in motion, or even worse, it accidentally powers on while parked and drains the battery. Over on the right side are the brake sensor and throttle. The brake sensor is a little push switch that actuates when I pull the brake. I screwed a little loop of wire onto the brake, then I very carefully zip tied the rest of the assembly such that the switch trips almost immediately after I actually start pulling the brake. In fact, if I pull very lightly, then I'll activate region without engaging the mechanical brake. Also on the right handlebar is the throttle. This uses a custom 3D printing clamp to attach to the handlebar. Like for the multifunction switch on the other end, there's affordance in this clamp to pass the other shifter cable down. However, unlike the multifunction switch, there is a GoPro-like attach point on the left side here, attaches a little nubbin that is raised just enough so that the throttle lever is at the right location for my thumb. Mostly, I use the throttle to aid in going from a stop. Sometimes I want to cross a semi-busy street, and this is the quickest way to get going. The way pedal assist works on this bike means I don't get instant assist. There needs to be some amount of actual rotation before the bike will apply assist. Other times, I just don't want to pedal. Now for the last major component, the battery mount system. The battery is straightforward enough. It's a 52 volt battery with 14 amp hours capacity for a whopping 700 watt hours of total capacity. Voltage is important because that directly affects the maximum speed the motor will spin at. 
the higher the voltage, the faster it'll spin. This voltage will enable the motor to power itself up to around 28 miles per hour, which is more than fast enough for me. I tend to keep it between 10 and 12 miles per hour. The capacity given in amp hours is a measure of how long it'll last. Generally, you want this to be as high a capacity as you can get. I went with this much capacity because I thought it would give me more than enough range, even as the battery degrades over time. Though given how efficient this bike is, I could have easily gotten away with a smaller battery. Now, the mount. This was a time. When I started this, I wanted to mount the battery directly underneath the rear rack. This would protect the battery on basically all sides while making really good use of the space, except that that empty space is at least partially used for suspension travel. And as it turns out, there's not enough space for me to mount the battery under there, which I learned after spending more time than necessary to build a mount. Lesson learned, test those assumptions as quickly as possible. Okay, so my backup was to mount the battery on top of the rear rack. It isn't ideal to have so much weight so high up, but in practice, I don't notice the bike balancing any different than before. However, the battery is pretty exposed right there. Plus it blocks me from mounting things like panniers up there, but the other approaches I considered were also not ideal. I've seen some people mount the battery under the tube. With underseat steering, there's not enough room to mount the battery there unless I suspend it with enough clearance for the steering, which doesn't seem like a good idea, and putting it there would shift the center of gravity too far forward anyway. A lot of recumbent trikes mount the battery to the side. I could do something like that, except this would take a lot of effort and it would unbalance the bike. Not enough to make it unrideable, but definitely more than mounting it on the top of the rear rack does. This might be worth experimenting with in the future, but mounting it on top was simpler. I could have mounted it up front, except there's not really a good place, plus now the bike is front heavy. So mounting it on top of the rear rack is the simplest approach. Cool. Now to build a base plate to securely attach the battery. I used half inch plywood as that base, with other pieces of plywood to sandwich the rack tubes with the plywood. These tubes are conveniently very close to half an inch, so I'll use some more half inch plywood and glue them to the main base. This made it very easy to line up the base plate on the rack. For attaching the battery to the base plate, most down tube battery enclosures have a cradle that the main battery can detach from. This cradle can then be bolted to the bottle cage and bosses on the down tube. I decided to reuse the same affordance by marking where these spaces are and drilling holes in two of the spots. I drilled this oversized because I'm going to use T-nuts to secure the bolts. For actually sandwiching the base plate, I decided to use simple bolts from the bottom up into some T-nuts. To prevent any issues with the battery colliding with the T-nuts during install, I wanted the T-nuts to be flush with the surface of the plate. To do this, I routed an inset with a plunge router. This tool was definitely too big for the job, but with some care, I got it good enough. With all that said, I put the pieces aside until I got around to painting them. This was my first time using spray paint and I think I did a good job. I definitely didn't hold the can far away enough at first, and I definitely applied the primer too heavily. I also didn't wait as long as I should have for the primer to dry, but the paint itself came out nicely, I think. Regardless, with the paint done, it was time to install the thing on the bike. First, I installed the T-nuts by using bolts to pull them into place. This worked great to ensure the nuts are set properly and that I'll be able to use them. With all the T-nuts installed, I bolted the base plate onto the bike. Next, I bolted it on the battery cradle before sliding in the battery itself and locking it in place. So that's all the major components. Now to wire everything together. And because this bike is long, with some components further apart than they would be on an upright bike, I had to get or even make extensions for a few things. The throttle and brake sensor both needed extensions. These were made by first measuring the length of the run using a string. I marked the exact length and laid out the string on a table to cut wire. When I did this, I added some extra length as a buffer just in case I messed up and needed to shorten the cable, or if I wanted to route it differently. This turned out to be unnecessary, but you know the saying about hindsight. With the cables cut, I inserted them in the heat shrink, which was difficult until I figured out that it'll go much faster if I first massage the heat shrink along the crease to open it up. The throttle and brake sensor both use JST SM connectors in a standard specified by Grin. They both only need three wires, positive, ground, and signal, but the brake sensor uses a four pin plug while the throttle uses a three pin plug. While at first confusing, why would you use a four pin plug when you only need three of them? It's actually brilliant because having separate plugs makes it really easy to plug things in correctly. The throttle cable can only connect to the throttle slot and so on. For these cables, I crimped the connectors and made the cable. Then I remade the brake cable because in the original cable, I misaligned the wires in the connector. It should have been one, two, four, but I installed it as one, three, four. The second one I was much careful on, double and triple checking everything before I closed everything up. It also looks significantly better now that I knew what I was doing. With the connectors attached, I took a heat gun to all the heat shrink to both protect the wires and make everything look nice. Thankfully, those are all the cables I had to make. Everything else was either long enough or I could easily source an extension for. For the main run of cable, I wrapped everything in spiral wrap as much as I could. This kept things neat and tidy, as well as minimizing the amount of zip ties in use. I also placed the cable along the right side of the bike where it wouldn't stretch as much when I fold the bike. Everything goes through the spiral wrap until it gets to the controls, where all the control cables split into another bit of spiral, while the battery and rear light cables continue onto the rear in their own spiral. I said at the top that this bike could fold. Can it still fold? 
Yes, it's slightly more involved now, but the bike is still foldable. Even prior to electrifying, it wasn't as easy to fold as, say, a Brompton. But this is perfectly serviceable for my uses, where I would fold it to fit in the rear of my airplane or on a train. This thing is a joy to ride. With how little I use the electrics, this easily results in a total range of around 200 miles on this battery, or 160 miles if I only use the middle 60% to maximize battery life. Currently, the plan is to take this bicycle camping. After all, there's more than enough battery for weekend trips. So that's my recumbent e-bike. It's been a great side project and I'm really happy with how it turned out. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's an amazing day for a ride. Thank you and have a great day.